We hear a lot about classical Greece and Rome as the foundations of the Western world. And it's true that these two civilizations did play an important role in establishing many of the foundations of the modern West. But you have to understand Greece in particular in the context of their broader interactions with the Eastern Mediterranean, with the outside world. So in this video and the next, we'll be taking a look at the interactions between the various components of the classical West, including Hellenic Greece, Persia, and the Hellenistic world. So we'll start with Hellenic civilization, which refers to the civilization of Greece proper. And when you're thinking about this context or, or the concept of Hellenic Greece, Greece proper, we want to focus primarily on mainland Greece, Crete, and then some of the coastal parts of Asia Minor. And one of the primary defining characteristics of the, the Greek mainland is its geography. And in particular, we're talking about a number of mountain ranges that divide uh, Greece into different components. It's very fragmented. Those mountain ranges also mean that there's a lack of cultivable land, meaning that agriculture, large-scale diversified agriculture, is difficult. Um, and there are also a number of strong coastlines, there's a lot of coastline, and a number of fine harbors in Greece that mean that this Greek world tended to rely on colony building and on trade with the outside world for a lot of its development. There were a couple of important early civilizations that started the process of populating and building up Greece proper, and those included the Minoans, and the Mycenaeans. The collapse of the latter in 1050 BCE resulted in a period that many historians refer to as the Greek Dark Ages. The Greek Dark Ages was more or less just a period in which literacy plummeted, population declined, learning and productivity um, was a little bit slower than at other points in time. And from this uh, from this collapse, if you will, or from this slowdown um, that was part of the Greek Dark Ages, a new political model would emerge in Greece. And that was the model of the polis. The plural of polis is polis, and we're referring to these Greek city-states. A polis, or a city-state, is uh, basically defined as the city and its surrounding countryside. It was largely an autonomous or self-governing region, uh, they were responsible for their own agriculture, for their own government, for religion, for trade. So they governed themselves. And consequently, in the late Dark Ages and in the early Hellenic period, people living in Greece would tend to identify more with with their city-state than with some concept of a nation-state. In other words, they didn't really identify as Greek. Uh, people living in Greece wouldn't have identified as Greek. They would have identified as Athenian or Spartan or Corinthian. Um, and that meant that the polis was kind of at the forefront of this political model. There were hundreds of polis at the peak of Hellenic Greece. Each was its own political and cultural unit. At the heart of the polis was something known as the Acropolis, um, and on this Acropolis, trading centers uh, emerged, religious institutions emerged. It truly became the heart of the city-state. There were uh, as many different kind of worldviews and, and approaches to government as there were city-states, as there were polis. There were a few common uh, government forms that you would see in these Greek city-states, including monarchy, oligarchy, aristocracy, democracy, and tyranny. So a uh, monarchy is ruled by a king, oligarchy ruled by a few, uh, aristocracy ruled by the elite or by the aristocrats, democracy is ruled by the people, and tyranny is ruled by someone who has taken power or seized power illegally. The the modern concept of tyranny tends to imply a bad ruler, and that wasn't necessarily true of tyranny in the ancient Greek world. Rather, tyranny just referred to the method of taking power rather than how well or how poorly one exercised power. So you would see these five basic uh, government approaches uh, or political forms in each of the polis that existed in Greece. And these polis and these political forms came to define the Hellenic world, which again refers to mainland Greece, Crete, 
and the coastal parts of Asia Minor. If we shift a little bit to the east, we can look at another important or influential civilization that would help to define the Eastern Mediterranean and would in turn help to define uh, the foundations of the classical West, and that was the Persian Achaemenid dynasty. The Achaemenid dynasty was established in 539 BCE by King Cyrus the Great and would last for roughly 200 years until it was conquered by Alexander the Great and the rise of the Macedonian state. So, the Achaemenid dynasty began with Cyrus, and it began when he took his nomadic warriors and started to conquer large parts of Mesopotamia. Remember, Mesopotamia roughly refers to the region between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in what is modern-day Iraq, and then moving into the Levant or the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. So, Cyrus the Great would conquer uh, the, it would conquer Mesopotamia and establish a foundation for the Achaemenid dynasty. His successor, his son Darius I, would extend Persian control further east to the Indus River Valley, west to Egypt, and then north to Anatolia, and Anatolia is in modern-day Turkey. His successor would extend it further from there. So much of the Achaemenid dynasty is a story of expansion, the story of Persian expansion and Persian control. In the Persian Golden Age, um, the Achaemenid dynasty ruled with what we might call a light hand. When they conquered territories, they didn't move in immediately and enforce the Persian way of life or enforce Achaemenid rules on the conquered people. Rather, conquered kingdoms were allowed to keep their own kings, their own social systems, their social norms. As long as they pledged their allegiance to the Persian emperor as the king of kings, what they called the Shahanshah, or the Shah for short, and as long as they paid their taxes and didn't cause problems, the Persian Achaemenid Empire more or less left the conquered kingdoms alone. They did establish a standard currency to ease trade across the empire. Taxes weren't too high, so they kept taxes relatively low, but that standard currency allowed the Shah, allowed the Persian emperors, to maintain control, to consolidate wealth through this shared currency. They used some of that wealth to improve infrastructure, making trade easier. Uh, the facilitation of trade increased wealth, made communication um, easier. For example, they built a royal road that connected the West and the East. They allowed many territories to practice their own religion because the dominant religion of the Achaemenid dynasty, which was called Zoroastrianism, had no conversion mission. Zoroastrianism was one of the first attempts at monotheism in the classical West um, and in the classical world. Zoroastrianism was a monotheistic and dualistic approach to religion, meaning that they professed a belief in one God above all others, that's the monotheism part. And they believed that good and evil were locked in a struggle. And that's the dualistic part. They did believe that good would eventually win out in this struggle between good and evil. Um, so it became an important, so this religion became an important part of their culture. But again, there was no civil, oh, sorry, there was no uh, missionary purpose, meaning they didn't set out to forcibly convert um, or convert people by any means necessary in these conquered territories. Plus, Zoroastrianism forbade, forbade um, slavery, and so slavery was almost unheard of in the Persian Empire under the Achaemenids. So you had these two great civilizations, um, this Greek civilization, which is dominated by uh, city-states, and this Persian civilization ruled by the Achaemenid dynasty. And they're going to come into conflict with each other in a way that would come to define the classical West. This is the story of the Persian Wars, which lasted from roughly 490 BCE to 480 BCE. And the story begins with an event known as the Ionian Revolt. In the Ionian Revolt, a group known as the Ionian Greeks, and those were Greeks living in the coastal regions of Asia Minor, in Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, under Persian rule. In 499, these Ionian Greeks rebelled against Persians. 
And they were supported in this venture by city-states like Athens and Eritrea. This revolt, this revolt though uh, defeated eventually by the Persians, destabilized the coastal parts of the empire. The Persians eventually won, and they wanted to ensure that no such revolts would happen in the future. And they wanted to punish Athens in particular for their support of the Ionian Greeks. So between 490 and 480 BCE, the Persians uh, launched a war, launched a campaign, a military campaign, against Athens and other Greek city-states. Athens called on the support of other Greek city-states in this defense against the Persian uh, incursion. And they would take leadership of a, a military alliance of a variety of Greek city-states. In the Persian Wars, there were multiple battles, um, Thermopylae, Marathon, Salamis, in which the Persians far outnumbered the Greek soldiers, but in which the Greeks held firm, often using their knowledge of the terrain to their advantage. And they, in many cases, they even managed victories. By 480 BCE, the Persian army was retreating, and the Greeks would go on to win the Persian Wars. In the wake of this victory, the Greeks, uh, or people from the Greek city-states, began to identify as Greek, to develop a sense of national identity, rather than just being defined by their polis. And the ultimate victory over Persia made Athens um, a leader among the Greek city-states. They would use this leadership to dominate the other city-states, pushing, uh, pushing Athens rather to a position of dominance, um, what was known as the Golden Age of Athens. And we'll start our story of the Golden Age of Athens and the ramifications of that Golden Age um, in the next video. Thank you.